So movies can take up years of a director's life, from those early days of hashing out a story and thinking about actors, all the way through to the press junket, the premiere, and a potential second round of promotion when the flick hits home media. So imagine hating the project that you're working on. Imagine hating working on something for four to five years, growing more and more resentful until the time that you can finally be done with it and move on. Well, those are the directors that we're talking about today, with some even going so far as to outright disown the films they worked on. Buckle up, my friend, because it's going to be a rough ride. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 directors who slammed their own movies. Number 10. James Cameron, Piranha 2, The Spawning James Cameron has obviously made some of the greatest movie sequels ever in the likes of Terminator 2 and Aliens, but a follow-up that audiences, critics, and the man himself aren't to follow up is 1982's box office bomb Piranha 2 The Spawning. Though it was Cameron's first feature debut, he's distanced himself from the project in the years since, even stating, I don't feel like it was my first movie. This is because he was fired midway through production, thus unable to finish the film himself. Understandably, he considers the far superior Terminator his actual feature debut. What's more, Cameron hasn't been afraid to talk about how badly Piranha 2 turned out, once labelling it horrible. He also said, Technically, I have a credit as the director on that film. However, I was replaced after two and a half weeks by the Italian producer. It was like, oh man, I thought I was doing a good job, but when I saw what they were cutting together, it was horrible. You can't blame the man for feeling that way, but in the end, he at least got the last laugh, with two of his movies, Titanic and Avatar, ranking in the top three high-grossest movie releases in cinema history. Number 9. Stephen Hopkins, The Ghost and the Darkness with a mixed 51% on Rotten Tomatoes and a single Oscar win, albeit in a technical category, 1996's The Ghost and the Darkness isn't considered to be an awful film, but director Stephen Hopkins would probably disagree. Reportedly, the production was an absolute nightmare, with snake bites, scorpion bites, and dangerous weather conditions plaguing the shoot. Oh, and many of the scenes in the film involved the use of real lions, which, as you can imagine, wasn't easy to manage. Adding insult to injury, The Ghost and the Darkness went on to flop at the box office, Office, and Hopkins later called it a mess, adding that it left such a bad taste in his mouth that he hasn't been able to watch it in full. Cheer up, mates. Yeah, at least you got the sound editing Oscar. Everybody wants one of those, right? Number 8. Stanley Kubrick, Fear and Desire it's incredibly rare for a director to knock it out of the park on their feature film. For obvious reasons, I mean, there's a lack of funding, a lack of resources, a lack of experience, and so on. Even the all-time greats are no different in that regard. And along with James Cameron, Stanley Kubrick is another legendary director who has complicated feelings towards his very first big screen outing. Though Fear and Desire has been favorably assessed in the decades following its 1953 release, urban legend has it that Kubrick once intended to destroy any and all prints that he could get his hands on, simply because he wasn't happy with his work. In 1994, he even called the flick a bumbling amateur film exercise, and reportedly told Warner Brothers to issue a statement labeling it boring and pretentious in order to discourage people from ever seeking it out. Inevitably, Kubrick's actions had the opposite effect, and curiosity in the film was only heightened. Today, it's widely available on Blu-ray, DVD, and streaming. Number 7. Steven Spielberg, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom often comes in third place when people rank the original indie trilogy, with the film's darker tone proving more of an acquired taste compared to the first and third installments. Back in 1984, it proved so edgy that it led to the creation of the PG-13 rating, which allowed kids under the age of 13 to see it, but only if they were accompanied by parents. Director Steven Spielberg is another person who thought that Temple of Doom is actually the worst of the original three, citing its dark and horrific tone as the main reason why. He said, I wasn't happy with the Temple of Doom at all. It was too dark, too subterranean, and too horrific. I thought it out paltered Poltergeist. There's not an ounce of my own personal feeling in Temple of Doom. Now, bearing in mind that Poltergeist, which Steven Spielberg wrote and produced as an actual horror movie, that definitely isn't suitable for kids. That's quite a bold statement. These days, you'd think that the widely panned Kingdom of the Crystal Skull would be Spielberg's least favorite indie movie, but considering that he once came to its defense, we're not so sure about that. Number 6. Noah Baumbach, Highball. Noah Baumbach's feature directorial career got off to a great start with 1995's Kicking and Screaming. And though this early momentum did eventually propel him to bigger and better places, such as his handful of Oscar nods for the fantastic marriage story, he immediately hit a bump in the road with his follow-up project. That project was Highball, a truly bizarre effort that proved so troublesome to make that Baumbach didn't even finish it. Dubbing the film a foolish experiment, the director's intent was to shoot Highball in just six days, using the same people that he'd already gathered 
for his other 1997 movie, one that he actually finished, Mr. Jealousy. Instead, the production ran out of money. He jumped ship and got somebody else to finish it, which has led to Bombactus owning the project in the years since. He said, It really was an experiment, a kind of foolish experiment, because I didn't think about what the ramifications would be if it didn't work. And it was a funny script, but it was just too ambitious. We didn't have enough time, we didn't finish it, it didn't look good, it was just a whole mess. Surprise, surprise, making movies, even small ones, is bloody difficult. Number 5. Matthew Kasovitz Babylon AD Vin Diesel movies that don't have the words fast and furious in the title generally tend to struggle, and his 2008 sci-fi flop Babylon AD was no different. Audiences hated it, critics hated it, and director Matthew Kasovitz hated it too. And though you'd expect him to keep those feelings to himself until the movie had finished its theatrical run, he didn't. Pulling a move that would later be replicated by Michael Bay, who we will definitely get to later, the director started bashing his own film before it even released, branding it pure violence and stupidity, which, to be fair, is actually a good description of most Vin Diesel movies. He then added that Babylon AD was like a bad episode of 24, and unsurprisingly, he hasn't been invited to direct a big budget Hollywood movie since. Number 4. Rennie Harlan, Exorcist The Beginning In a chat with The Guardian in 2021, Exorcist The Beginning director Rennie Harlan told the outlet, I knew from the script that it wasn't going to be great, and in the end, his instincts proved to be bang on the money. Harlan signed on to helm the film after the original director, Paul Schrader, was fired, which obviously wasn't an ideal situation to enter. Even worse, Harlan was instructed to reshoot everything Schrader had already filmed, and that's not to mention the series of spooky incidents that happened throughout the production, including Harlan being hit by a car and hospitalized Kaya Tars blowing up at random, and most bizarrely, the roof of a crew member's house being torn apart by five giant crows. The reward for all of this trouble was a disastrous 10% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, a box office flop, and William Peter Blatty, writer of the original Exorcist, calling the beginning his most humiliating professional experience. In that same interview with The Guardian, Harlan also said that the beginning didn't come out very well, which, frankly, feels like a wee bit of an understatement. Number 3. Michael Bay Ambulance if there's one thing that you can expect from a Michael Bay movie, it's enough action and explosions to make your eyes glaze over. His latest effort, Ambulance, is no different, with so much bayhem thrown at the screen that it's a miracle that he made it for a relatively modest sum of $40 million. Bay's desire to use practical effects as much as possible perhaps helped keep that cost so low, and indeed, according to the man himself, there's very little CGI in the film. But of the CGI that is in the film, well, let's just say that Bay isn't too keen. In fact, during the movie's press tour, he outright called some of it, shit. Some of the CGI is shit in this movie. There's a couple of shots that I wasn't happy with, okay? Possibly at the behest of the studio, which can't have been pleased at all with the bad press, Bay then proceeded to downplay his comments in subsequent interviews, changing his choice of words from shit to don't like. Gee, way to go, Michael. That'll definitely make all of those hard-working VFX artists feel better about their contribution. Number 2. Michael Bay again, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen Though critics aren't exactly calling Ambulance a work of cinematic genius, it has been praised for its thrills, intensity, and lead performances, and at least managed to hold a fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. But the consensus on 2009's Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, also directed by Bay? Yeah, that was nowhere near as positive. Bloated, stupid, and colder than the metal those Transformers are made of, watching Revenge of the Fallen is a good way to give yourself a headache. And even Bay himself has some serious regrets about how the movie turned out, telling Empire in 2011 that it was crap. To give Revenge of the Fallen a little bit of credit, it was badly affected by the Hollywood writers' strike, which resulted in the script being rushed. Then again, Bay's other Transformers movies still sucked even without a strike going on, so this probably didn't make much of a difference in the end. And number 1. Josh Trank – Fantastic Four 2015 Josh Trank's Fantastic Four is one of the most fascinating blockbuster failures in modern history. Not because of the film itself, of course, which is just terrible, but because of the drama that surrounded it. Midway through production, it was reported that the movie was in trouble, with Fox executives mandating reshoots in order to fix what they perceived was a mess. It was said that Trank also misbehaved on set, which is another reason why Fox eventually decided to take the movie off him and significantly rework it. Jump ahead to the film's horrendous reviews in 2015, and a frustrated Trank decided to hop on Twitter, lamenting the loss of his fantastic original cut, while throwing Fox under the bus by implying that the theatrical version was poor. He said, A year ago, I had a fantastic version of this, and it would have received great reviews. You'll probably never see it. That's reality, though. Unsurprisingly, the director slamming his own movie on the eve of its release did little to help its prospects, and it bombed in every possible sense of the word. All sequel plans were scrapped, and Trank later doubled down on his dissatisfaction by saying that he would gladly erase the movie from existence. You know what, mate? 
we would too. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 directors who slammed their own movies. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming outside of work, and it'd be great to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself with love and respect, because sometimes we can work on projects for years at a time that don't quite work out the way that we intended. But you know what? Don't get angry at those situations. Learn from those experiences, my friend. Build on the lessons that you learned along the way, because at the end of the day, as unfun as it is, failure and finding your limitations are an honest teacher. You can find out where you need to ask for help. You can find where your energies are best spent. And sometimes you can just gain a bit of perspective, which in the grand scheme of life is a very good thing to have. So remember, just be kind to yourself in those moments. Take a break if you need it and get back out there and show the world that you can do this. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.